Everyone, welcome to the Doctors Are Running podcast, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, talk about the art and the science of the things we put on our feet. Tonight, or today, or in the morning, wherever you are, it is just me. It's going to be a solo episode with Matt, doc, Dr. Klein, whatever you want to call me. It doesn't really matter as long as it's relatively respectable. Um, it's just going to be do, me doing another solo episode tonight, and I've got some thoughts, and hopefully I don't ramble too much because I'm a little exhausted. I just got back from uh, the combined section meeting for physical therapy, which is a great experience, just a little exhausting because I've had a sinus infection the whole time, and it's raging, and it's getting better. Hopefully I don't snot during this. We'll see what happens. I wonder if PJ will cut that out. Um, I am a little overwhelmed at the moment, so you're going to get an interesting combination of thoughts because I am in the middle of PhD data collection. I'm taking a third board certification, board specialty certification in a week, which is probably a mistake, but we'll see what happens. Redoing a systematic review for the third time to try to get it published and trying to do this at the same time and enjoying the heck out of it. I just want to say before we get started and before we dive into something that I hope is very helpful for everyone that I'm immensely thankful, not only for the people that watch, listen, read, whatever medium you digest this material, uh, I'm, I'm immensely thankful that people follow us and have learned and have been really positive, and I really appreciate it. There's been good feedback, but at CSM, it was a really cool experience to be stopped in the street or in the conference hall or get recognized and for people to say, it's really cool what you're doing, and I, you know... This started a long time ago, just me not knowing if, ever, if anybody would ever care and just was hope, I was hoping that I could provide something that would give people a glimpse into what my journey was to try to understand what I was putting on my feet, what was happening in my body and hope, hopefully helping them along in that same journey, whether they were a consumer and putting on a running shoe, whether they were an elite, whether they were a footwear developer trying just trying to make better shoes and do their job, you know, and trying to learn is really what it comes down to. So I appreciate this. And I want people to know that we don't have all the answers and we're trying to learn just like everybody else. And we appreciate you following along on this journey. And that's kind of where I want to take you right now, because where all this started is talking about running shoes and figuring out what works for you, what doesn't work for you. So my journey on this started in PT school and beyond or before that, excuse me, when I was working in running stores in college and even before that in high school, when I jumped into running and I was like, Hey, the major tool that you have during running is a pair of running shoes, right? There's other components like shorts and stuff like that, which is a different story, but it's the, really the main interaction between yourself and the ground is a pair of shoes. And as someone who was immensely curious, but also maybe a little hypersensitive, found that that's not the right word, but it was just like hyper aware of what I was putting on my feet, the forces coming to my body as I was getting used to running. I was like, what the heck am I putting on my feet? And a lot of the stuff I found I didn't like because I didn't really have any guidance. When I would go into a running store, they would just go, hey, you pronate this amount. This is the shoe you need. And that's kind of going on this old model, which I'll call the like more the biomechanical model, the pronation model that suggested that we should be fitting shoes based on how much people pronate. That was the industry's for the longest time attempt to categorize shoes and categorize people and where they should be. And anybody that worked in a running store that was really thinking about this and exploring this on their own body can tell you that that really did not work. You know, I can tell you somebody who was put in that pronation category that found that I hated all the stability shoes. They sucked. There was a couple light stability ones at that time were really cool that seemed to work better, but I was not doing super well. I went to the extreme, was exploring barefoot minimalist shoes and probably took that a little farther than necessary and jumped in too quick. So there were some injuries, obviously, but just kept going. I was back and forth, just trying to explore and find something that worked for me. And I, you know, never, I don't know if I ever found a perfect shoe. I think there were moments where it was perfect, not realizing that our bodies change with time. But I don't want all of you to go through that same thing. I want you to get to your answers quicker, which is part of being a teacher and a professor, which is I'm a full-time professor right now. I want my students to be better than me and I want them to get where I am faster so they can take that farther. And that's, exactly where I want to try to take you. And we're not going to get that in 20, 30 minutes, but I'm hoping to expose you to some concepts to get your brains thinking there. Because if I can help you think, and if I can help you process what's put, you're putting on your feet, I think I'm going to be able to help you figure out what's going to work better for you. Because you've heard us say before, shoes are tools. A different tool is going to work differently for a different person. 
right? Some person, your neighbor or your running buddy is going to like this shoe and you may or may not like that. And that's okay because you have totally different bodies, I assume. So that's okay. So now that we know the, the, some of the biomechanical models don't work, and I say that because we have evidence that a lot of them don't always work, that these models, you know, hey, we will try to correct this motion, especially when it comes from a pain type model. We know that just because we put you in certain thing doesn't necessarily mean your pain is going to change just because we alter biomechanics. It might it might not. Pain is not just a physical component. That's a very complex conversation that is beyond the scope of a 20-minute conversation, but is the topic of my of my uh, presentation to my students on Monday tomorrow, which that is going to be a, a very intense lecture. And uh, maybe it's a little rough for Monday. Nah, they're going to deal with it. I bring them coffee so they can they can handle this. So we know that, especially when it comes to injuries and pain, the biomechanical model doesn't always work. We do know, for example, we do know sometimes it does work. We know that for people that have a history of pronation related injuries, that oftentimes a little bit of support and some pronation modifying mechanisms is probably the best way I'm going to say this, like a medial post or some of those other components can reduce injuries for people that have had that history. doesn't mean they'll eliminate them, but it can reduce the incidence of them. But not always, right? So there's and there's other things that don't match that. Other injuries that that are probably that may or may not respond to those things, and the inconsistency is also in the fact that certain people you put them in a posted shoe, and they are their their amount of pronation doesn't actually change, right? It continues on through whatever device you put. We found that with heel counters and certain measures that we thought that would lock the heel in. It doesn't necessarily change your internal heel motion, right? You'll keep moving. People will perceive and they'll say this feels better, but their motion won't necessarily change. And that's where we're having an issue. We're seeing the same thing in uh, the world of medicine as well, where people will say, I feel this difference. I feel it feels better. It doesn't feel as painful. But then biomechanically, you may not see a change. Those things don't always match. So what does that mean? That means that our perception of the world doesn't always match what is happening physically or biomechanically. And that's not a bad thing. That's very well known. That's that, you know, that the sensory system, right? The system that in our body that takes up and figures out, hey, what am I feeling? What's going on? What's dangerous? All these different components there doesn't always match the, the physical characteristics. That's why, you know, on an extreme end, that's why we have things like hallucinations that sometimes happen. That's why we can have things like phantom limb pain, where you can have sensation pain for something that's not there, which is very real, by the way. That's There's not always a connection there. And this is a really roundabout way. I'm probably making this more complicated for most of you that are trying to listen about geeking out about shoes. For me to kind of introduce why I think the Run Cat Footwear Comfort Scale is one of the best things to come out recently. It's something that I think about consistently. And for those people in running stores or those that are medical professionals trying to fit people for shoes, I am really going to encourage you, if you have the time, it's not always feasible, and I get that as someone who's worked um, for Kaiser Permanente and some other institutions where kind of you gotta, you got to move. I think it's a really great way for t- for to learn two things. I think it's great for you as the clinician to be able to have this thing and get some subjective explanation from the patient. In addition to hopefully your objective testing about going, hey, how is the person perceiving this? When you put them in a shoe or when they get a shoe on, because we often forget to really reassess how the person feels. Sometimes people just put them in the shoe and go, this is great. This is what you need. Bye. You know, you got to like, this is the big thing about becoming a master, whatever you do, you got to test and retest, see what happens. You got to problem solve math, you know, Experts don't just get there by, oh, I know this. It happens through repetition of testing and seeing and keeping an open mind of what happens. The same thing happens for the person, the patient, the the runner, the whomever, the person who's testing the shoe. It's equally important for them to see, get some visual feedback when they mark this scale because it's a nice, it's a nice, you know, a nice line visual scale that you can kind of mark and see where do things go. We'll dive into this a little bit more. So it's it's both parties get to learn from this and get to pick up some patterns and realize, hey, maybe this shoe works for me. Maybe it doesn't. What about this shoe works? What about it doesn't? That's a, Those are great learning opportunities because there is no perfect shoe. There's different shoes that are going to work differently for different people, but each person can, kind of needs to learn what's going to work well for them. And that's part of this journey. And I'm not trying to make this complicated, 
because this is just what happens. You got to get your reps in. Somebody who's a new runner, you got to just get in a store if you can and try a bunch of things on. See what you like, see what you don't. Go run in it, go test it to see was your running, did that match what you tried on the store? Was it different? Be open to that and learn from it. Go, oh, that didn't work. Let me go try this one. Oh, that was great. Put that one in your brain. That's great. You know, it's the same thing for those of us who are trying to learn this stuff. And it, it can be challenging when you're trying to re review shoes. And I'm asked, always ask myself, am I doing a good unbiased job of this? And the true answer is there's always going to be a little bias, but that's why I encourage you to see all of our different reviewers and go, hey, who do you tend to match? What do your taste match with? Who do your taste match with? I'm sorry. It's nine o'clock, 917. Give me a break. So... The Run Cat is a scale that was developed by Christopher Bishop down in Australia, who did a phenomenal, phenomenal job of developing the scale. And it is, again, it's called the Run Cat. It's called the Running Footwear Comfort Assessment Tool. And it he they they took his group took 19 different items that describe different components of the shoe and and how it might feel and fit and what have you. And they, over this three-stage process, were able to distill this thing down to four main components with the fifth one being overall shoe comfort. And I will tell you, and I should have published this as an additional outside – as a validation or reliability testing, that when I was in my – I was in my – the didactic, the school part of my PhD program, I was taking a survey class, which I thought was a waste of time because I was just interested in biomechanics. I was like, get me in the lab. This has been a repeated story, by the way. Anytime I say this is probably going to be useless, it's probably going to be a super helpful and eye-opening experience, which this was. And I was like, hey, I see that the run cat just came out. I'm arrogant. Let me – I can do this better. You know what? I can't do it better. I absolutely bombed and struggled and had to – not only went through this process trying to create my own, but had to re – had to go back and then understand – why this, how long this takes, how complicated it is. They had a really good number of subjects, but then also the amount of work that went into validating those four, what might seem like simple things is actually incredibly important. So Chris, if you're ever listening to this phenomenal job, that was absolutely awesome. Um, it's really, really cool to see this and to have put this out in the world. So thank you for doing that. It's as mentioned, there's only four major components that come from this. And it's also available. If you look up RunCat, you will find it online. The full article you need to probably purchase or have some uh, subscription to uh, from like a – either subscribing to the journal, uh, which I'm trying to remember what the journal uh, – I'm going to feel stupid if the journal of – yeah, no, it's Journal of Sports Sciences. Have a subscription or university access or get your buddy or person that you know in a university to get that. Uh, access. But the, the simple document that has the components on it is available. And I would encourage you to download it because it was it's released in a very user-friendly way. They have stuff like person name, ID, height, body mass, shoe size, all kinds of stuff like that. Difference between left and right. It's great. So the four components that they did to say, and again, this is not like a scale like you measure your foot or whatever. This is a perception, right? What is your perceived comfort of these different things on a scale? A scale going from, you know, a very high level to a very low level and not necessarily good or bad. And that was what I really enjoyed. And it really helped me think differently. So the four things outside of shoe comfort is heel cushioning, forefoot cushioning, shoe stability and forefoot flexibility. And I'm going to repeat this again before you get all, oh, you know, he's, you know, it's probably like more heel cushioning, more forefoot cushioning, super stable. It was actually along the lines of does it feel good for you, right? Is good being is good in the middle? Does it feel like the heel cushioning? Did it feel too firm on one end or too soft? So one side of the scale wasn't necessarily good. It was trying to find out for you or you're, the individual you're trying to help, where's the optimal level, which I thought was really cool because that's what we're trying to find. Because I've always said, you know, more is not better. Less is not necessarily better. It's finding that perfect balance for the person. So let's talk about heel cushioning first. When they were talking about this, they said, hey, when you're, when you're standing or whatever in the shoe, you should be standing. Don't do this in sitting. Standing, running. And again, you should be running because standing and running are not the same or walking, whatever you're using the shoe for. When you're putting the shoe on, and you are putting pressure through the heel, how does that cushioning feel? Does it feel too soft or does it feel too firm? Or if you're going to put this thing right in the middle, does it feel just right? And you're looking for that just right level. 
That's great, right? There are certain people love super soft heels. Some people really don't. Some people like a little bit more firmness. I tend to like a little bit more balance. I don't like it being so stiff that my heels hurt, but I don't like it being so mishy that it's unstable. So it's finding that optimal balance for you. If you can find that, boom, you got a feeling that you know you know my work for you. And if you feel another shoe, hey, that might be something that works. The second thing was the same concept for the forefoot cushioning. So under the ball of your foot, and I have the Brooks Diet Eleven here, if it, under the ball of your foot, how does the cushioning feel? Same concept. Is it too soft? Is it too firm? Or is it in the middle? And where on that scale does that fit? Is it on one side? Is it in the middle? How good is it? Same thing. Forefoot cushioning to me is pretty important. I've had some uh, metatarsal issues in college when I was really experimenting with barefoot stuff. So I like a decent amount of forefoot cushioning. That's just me though. Other people might, might not. So that's another really important thing. So you got the how does the heel feel? How does the forefoot feel? The third thing is how stable does the shoe feel? And as some of the some of you that listen to this or watch or read, most know that I need a little bit of stability. And that's why I've talked about the concept of stable neutral is that you don't always need a post. You just need to make sure the shoe is stable for you. And that means not too flimsy, but also not too rigid because too rigid can be just as problematic as too unstable. And that's exactly where this scale goes is, hey, is it not stable or is it too rigid or is it just right? And you're again, you're looking for a just right level. And that kind of gets slightly off topic on this. That's why I really like the concept of stable neutral because a lot of the sidewalls and stuff like that, instead of shoving your foot in a certain way, it really just tries to help support you and try to keep you in the middle rather than trying to force you in a certain direction. And how much of that you're going to need is going to be very dependent on you as a person. And it might vary too. The last thing they talked about was talking about forefoot flexibility. When you And again, this goes back to our stuff talking about McClode and the different levels of forefoot stiffness. More flexibility is not better. Less flexibility is not necessarily better. Is what level of stiffness or flexibility is going to work best for you? Does it feel comfortable? And it should feel comfortable. And you should, when you put the shoe on, you're like, wow, it feels pretty good. That's a good sign. If you're like, this feels not so good, that's not a good sign. So it could be too flexible, too stiff. So when you roll off that thing, what's it feel like? And the final score, uh, the thing was the overall comfort, right? Which is kind of really important to start thinking about how does the upper fit? What's that like? And yeah, it's the same thing. Is it comfortable? Is it not comfortable? The upper should fit really well on your foot. You shouldn't feel things rubbing on your foot. In this day and age, you really shouldn't have to break in things a lot because their companies actually spend development money trying to figure out how to make it feel good on your foot the second you put it on. You know, this it the upper should fit nicely to your foot. Things have got more flexible, more adaptive. It should it should almost feel like you're not wearing anything. If you notice a lot of stuff there in a bad way, maybe not something you're gonna want to worry about you're gonna want to consider. But if it's just like, hey, this thing disappears off my foot, this is a comfortable shoe, boom, you're pretty good to go. So again, just to recap, heel cushioning, how's it feel under your heel? Forefoot cushioning, how's it feel under your forefoot? Stability, how is that? Does it feel, is this feel just right? Is it, it's not too, st- it's not too rigid. It's not too, it's not too unstable. Is it just right? Does it keep your foot where you want it to be? And then what's the the forefoot flexibility? Can you roll off the toes nicely? Does it feel good? Is it too rigid? Is it the stiffness that you want so you can pop off? You know, pop off the toes, I'm sorry. And then finally, shoe comfort. Especially, and I would encourage people to think about the upper and how does it fit your foot? How's that feel up there? And these four or five items... Again, for people that haven't done survey research, it's really hard to get there. They did this several times in these 19 items. You got to put all these stats through this, reassess it over and over and over and over and over again. And they came up with these four or five things. And it might sound simple, but there's a lot of complexity in finding that simplicity. So enjoy it. So take that. And so if you are trying to learn what shoes work better for you, this is a great place to start. Yes, you have resources like our website where we'll tell you, hey, this fits like this, this feels like this, but how do you know what's gonna work for you? We don't necessarily, we try not to say, hey, this is a good thing. Some biases are certainly gonna come out where I'm gonna get really excited about a shoe and I have to be aware of that and try to redo it and be a little bit more objective, but there's always a subjective component. There's always a bias. So that's where I really encourage you to get to know that and work with it if you're looking for yourself or others because it's a great tool to start recognizing some patterns for either patients or yourself. And some of some people might get upset as I am becoming a biomechanist as my PhD is in biomechanics and I'm looking at the biomechanics 
and the strength factors in masters runners to understand what, how their changing bodies are impacting their injury rates and injury types and if there's any relationship there. And yeah, so I study biomechanics. I study the the objective physical components, but you have to recognize that, as I mentioned earlier, those physical things don't always match with our perceived comfort. They don't always match with the um, feeling of a shoe. And we know that the more comfortable a shoe is, the more likely it is to work for a person. That's probably because they're more likely to wear it. If a shoe doesn't feel good, you're not going to put it on your feet, right? So there's some other factors there, but there is good evidence suggesting that comfort is a really, really good predictor of whether shoes are going to work. And people have been looking for years trying to go, what, how do we prescribe shoes? If this pronation model doesn't work all the time, then what do we do? And that's where, you know, those like Ben O'Nid talked about the comfort filter and the movement and the preferred movement paradigm. And, you know, this seems to be the big thing. And I can tell you from being at the combined section meeting for physical therapy, the really good talks really emphasized looking at the individual. And that's hard, right? Because it's much easier to go, oh, blanket statement, everybody does this. That's not how it works because we are all very different. We're all very different in how we perceive things and what works for us. And again, like I said, I'm aware of that. And I always think about that when I'm writing reviews going, I hope this helps people. And you know, that's why it's also lots of review sites. If you find that ours don't work and you want to look at read somebody else's because it works better for you, do it. Because at the end of the day, our website is there to share things and help you learn. If you get something, if you learn something new about it and then it helps you figure out some, figure this out from somewhere else, that's fine. You know, it's about helping you on this journey. But just remember that perception and biomechanics don't always match. So for those in running stores, you need to recognize that you're going to see people come in that have super high arch feet and you've been told, no, 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 don't give that person pronation stuff. And they're going to be like, I want my Keanu. I want my Brooks Beast. You're like, this shouldn't work for them. And they'll put it on and their mechanics look exactly the same. And you're like, how does that work? It's because there's more variables at play than we can often recognize. And it takes a lot of experience to start learning how to put all those pieces together uh, that I'm still working on. You know, from a biomechanical model, there's lots of variability in how humans react to surfaces. Some people will react very stiff to certain surfaces. Some people will have a lot more mobility to a softer, firm surface. People will also perceive those same surfaces very differently. That's why you'll see reviewers, some will say, this shoe feels super firm. And they're like, oh, it feels a little bit softer. Some of it's descriptive, but some of it's also people are actually experiencing that differently because their perception is going to be real to them, but it may not match whatever durometer you might be putting in the shoe because there's a lot of variables that go into that. Things like the sensor receptors in their feet, all the neurons that go into all their joints and that that help you go, hey, when I land, how quick is my foot moving? What do I feel under my foot? You know, How quickly does the cushioning compress? What do I feel from the insole? That's going to be different from different people. And I'm not trying to complicate this or scare you. I'm just saying that's how it goes. And that's why you'll see some variations in reviewers. And it doesn't mean that what we do as reviewers is useless. It means that you need to take that with a grain of salt and try to apply it to you, right? So sensory perception is really important for trying to figure out what's going to work for people. And all kudos to the the running companies that try to figure this out because you've got to make a shoe – That tries to work for as many different people as possible because at the end of the day, yeah, you want to make a cool product for people. But you also – it's a business. You want to sell shoes. You you want these to not suck. So how do you figure out how to make these work for the largest population as possible? So what you do is when you're wear testing, you get this big sample of people and you try to get this – you know, and hope that you get you average out all the responses over the wear testing and you try to put and try to find the average because that's the only metric you can think of. And you try to go, hey, you know, what's this average or this, this, you know, what term am I looking for? This spread of data here, kind of in the middle here, you know, what is it? These people are all saying this. So here's where, we, you know, this is where this shoe needs to go. But the problem is what this average right here is saying doesn't necessarily represent the variation that people expand, which is why it's okay that there are tons of running shoes. Uh, you, you, People often get overwhelmed with choices, but when you when there's that much more choice, that means you just need to learn better about what works for you. And that's just, you know, it's you – know, I'm not trying to put it like saying it's your fault. I'm saying it's an opportunity for people to learn. And I, this some people may say this is too complicated. It's like I just want to get these shoes on and go for a run. I don't want to worry about this stuff. I got enough stuff on my plate, which I get. But it 
it is worth investing a little bit of time and trying to figure out what works for you. And that the other, you know, because shoes change. And for those that have been around for a while, you've already seen massive changes, but also know that it's very common that companies will change their models and the models won't be the same. So it's a good idea to practice this a little bit, not only so you have a good idea of what to figure out when your favorite shoe changes, but also because your body is going to change with age. The only, you ever heard the phrase, the only constant in life is change. And if you're not able to adapt to that, that's going to be difficult. I tell you this as a geriatric clinical specialist, I study older individuals and I treat a lot of older individuals. Our bodies change. It doesn't mean you can't continue doing what you want to do. You might have to change some of your expectations or modify your training to opt to work with your body, but things are going to change. And your footwear, change, my, your footwear preferences might change. We know that feet tend to change quite a bit. One of the common things, my wife is 16, 17 weeks pregnant right now, and her feet are changing quite a good bit. Her fit preferences, her foot preferences, sh- oh my gosh, it's late. Shoe preferences are changing. And that's just what happens as our bone structure changes with some of the hormones that are going through her body, as some of the um, biomechanics of her body change, as some of her ligaments are changing in their laxity because of the hormone relaxant and what's happening. It's a little, little on the early side for that. But there's changes that happen with pregnancy. There's changes that happen with age. There's things that happen to us, you know, injuries, experiences, positions, you know, what we have to sit now that we have to get used to get to walk all day. Change is constant. And for that reason, I would encourage you to take a couple seconds to look over the run cat and ask yourself, how does this apply to me? Are these things that I assess when I'm putting a pair of shoes on? Because I can encourage you and I can almost promise you that if you can learn this well, it'll make things faster. You don't have to spend endless time in the store going, oh, like, what shoe is this? What shoe? You'll know and you'll have better ideas of going, oh, I've, I've seen that forefoot before. And I know that doesn't always work for me, but I'm going to try it. Nope, didn't work. So now another another little um, feather in the cap to know I, I know that better. So I'm just trying to encourage you to be open to learning. I can tell you with all the stuff behind my name, all the things I've done, I'm still trying to learn. That's why I'm psycho or stupid enough to be taking another board exam that is not necessary, but I'm doing it just because I want to be – I just want that opportunity to get schooled, to, to be humbled and go, oh, I need to learn more. Um, by doing more specialties if I have the opportunity to learn more. And that's what I hope that all of you can get from this. And hopefully I didn't ramble too much on this. I definitely need to keep working on my visual contact and trying to maintain on the camera, but that's a different problem. So we all go learn, right? So I hope that was helpful. And I hope that was a little helpful brain dump of mine of some of the stuff I was thinking about. I know we went over the Runcat really briefly, but I just wanted to talk about some of the things that are going through my head about how do we perceive the world? What is pain you know, how do we respond to footwear? What is our sensory system doing in terms of how we, how we perceive that world? And how do we, how does that work for a pair of shoes? Which is really cool to think about that. Um, there's some cool opportunities that we at doctors running and you as the listeners are going to get to have, as we will try to share with you, as we learn more and get to, we're going to get to meet a couple different companies this year in person. And I'm so excited. One's actually happening next week and we'll update you with, you with some information uh, as soon as we are able to, there's going to be some very cool footwear that's coming out that I am very excited seeing that we've been geeking out since last year. There's always cool stuff that who knows what's going to happen. New companies are going to reach out to us. We've had like, you keep, you know, I'm very thankful for all the experiences that we've had. I'm thankful for all of you that have either just joined us or been following on this journey and hope it's been helpful. But I'm also very thankful for those that have joined me on the team, Nathan, David, Bach, Andrea, Megan, BJ, right? All these, this wonderful group that we have here that is so kind to share their time. I don't know if you know this. We none of us do this full time. This is this is a passion thing. This is what we share. It's challenging because we all have full time jobs, but it's really fun. And I'm very happy to have these people that I really consider a family that have been very supportive along this journey and trying to share. And it's been sharing my dream of trying to help all of you and everyone either find better shoes, make better shoes. And I think maybe most importantly, ask better questions. Cause that's, that's one of my things as a professor is I want to help people think better. You, the information's out there. What you do with it is one of the most important things. So if I can help some of you think better about what you're putting on your feet and maybe critically analyze it and don't be afraid to speak out and ask questions and go, well, that doesn't make sense. 
That's part of the questioning. That's part of the learning. So just like the run cat, don't be afraid to think a little bit. I really appreciate you following along. As always, check out all the different avenues that our stuff comes out on. There's many, many different social media sites that we have. As always, the blog slash website has always been there. We'll continue to update materials. The, the YouTube stuff is doing super well. Thank you for all the followers that are jumping there. I think we're almost at 10,000 followers, 10,000 subscribers, which is nuts to me. Um, we've got the podcast, which is a various areas, Spotify and, and what have you. We've got LinkedIn, we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, Instagram, all anything that you're interested in. Feel free to consume that information. Know that for those of you that have emailed us, I'm doing my best to get to those emails. We really appreciate them. Thank you to the multiple students that emailed saying they had a great time at CSM. It was wonderful to meet all of you as well. And I wish all of you a wonderful year of running and a wonderful year of exploration. If you're running healthy, great. If you've got an injury, I hope you learned something from it and you progress through it. And as always, if there's anything you're interested in, if you have anything you'd love to see, let us know. We do, we're learning just as much as you. So if you have anything to offer, let us know and hope you enjoyed this episode.